So uh, we wanted to, I see some familiar faces emerging um, in policy as well. Um, we wanted to uh, start this conversation on day two to really talk about how, how policymakers and government agencies are really working to create change as well in the tech industry. It's something we don't often talk about. And, um, and all of these individuals are doing great things in this space. So um, this is an opportunity to hear what they're working on and also to learn how to, how to better engage with policymakers and, and really um, um, work together to create an inclusive tech ecosystem. So let's start by um, just introductions, who you are, where you work, and how your work intersects with technology. So good morning, everyone. I'm Kelly Jenkins Paltz, and I'm the Regional Administrator for the US Department of Labor Women's Bureau, which is based here in San Francisco. And my agency looks at where women are in the workplace, what occupations and industries they predominantly work in. We look at their wages and how they compare to men's and how they change over time. And we also look at benefits that help women thrive in the workplace. Uh, hi, my name is Jennifer Anastasoff. Uh, I'm one of the, I was one of the founding leadership team of the United States Digital Service uh, that came about after uh, healthcare.gov didn't do so well initially under President Obama. And President Obama saw that when you bring in uh, diverse ideas, when you bring in engineers, designers, uh, you can actually turn around uh, problems in government that can really impact humans. And so decided, you know what, we should create a group uh, that actually does this a lot of the time. <laughs> uh, and so we've continued uh, within, uh, within the United States Digital Service and we've continued at the Office of Management and Budget. Um, I'm, I've been head of people uh, at the organization, but today I'm here in my personal capacity. <laughs> Good morning. It's great to be here. A um, lot better weather than in DC right now. I am with the, <laughs> my name is Charlotte Burroughs. I am with the US Equal Employment Opportunity Commission which is a commission that was born out of the 1963 March on Washington. It was an explicit ask of Dr. King and others who were there to have an agency that focused on equal employment opportunity for everyone. And so we have been around for a long time and have uh, worked hard to stay nimble. I've been looking a lot at diversity in tech. I am one of five uh, Senate-confirmed um, commissioners. We are, there are five of us, and so we do things by majority vote. Um, I am one of the Democratic appointees, but I am proud to say that we have operated in a very bipartisan fashion, and um, I am delighted to be here for this conversation. Awesome. And um, go, go ahead and talk a little bit um, about how your work intersects. Uh, there were several people just came in, and so just a real brief introduction again. Uh, sure. So for those who uh, just came in, I'm Scott Weiner. I represent. Uh, San Francisco and part of San Mateo County in the California State Senate. And before that, um, I was a member of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors uh, for six years. Uh, and so uh, we, uh, uh, you know, we work with uh, tech on uh, legislation, whether it's uh, regulation um, of the industry, which people either love or, or don't love, um, <laughs> and also uh, um, on uh, more general issues around workplace protections uh, around, um, you know, paid family leave, um, around just, you know, various uh, policies that affect not just tech, but uh, the workplace uh, in general. Awesome, awesome. Great. Um, so do you all believe that, um, that policymakers and government agencies, both at the, at the local, state, and um, federal level, have a responsibility to, to be a part of the tech ecosystem, and what is that responsibility? What, is, what, is that, what does that mean to you? I mean, I think that yes, you know, government does have a role to, um, one, ensure compliance with existing law, and second is to, you know, encourage innovation and best practices and, uh, and promote the business case for diversity, mm. and that's a lot of what the Women's Bureau does. I would say that the tech industry has a role being uh, working with government um, mm -hmm. in a number of different ways. And with the United States Digital Service, basically what folks do is folks from the tech industry, engineers, technical product managers, designers, come and spend anywhere from three months to a year, two years, uh, working on critical issues, right? And here's the thing, is that government inherently serves 
everyone. We have to. Uh, and that is something that the tech industry actually doesn't face. In a lot of cases, uh, the tech industry gets to say, this is my target audience. That's my target audience. You know, uh, uh, Uber for cats and sushi. Like, that's my target audience right there. <laughs> but, but the fact is that government serves everyone, including our most vulnerable population. And if and when the tech industry uh, successfully serves that population or when government successfully serves that population via tech, that's when we'll know we've actually made it a long way in tech. Mm -hmm. well, I, I love the way you frame that because mm -hmm. just to pick up um, where Jennifer left off, we actually, as a nation, have a broad you know, understanding that at work you should have a fair shake, right? That is a fundamental value of everyone. And our agency and the role of government is to make sure that those laws that were enacted with broad bipartisan majorities um, that say that you have a right to work, that you can't be discriminated against based on national origin, race, gender, um, and in the equal employment opportunities eyes, and we have been pushing this in court even now, some people are confused about whether, what our position is, that includes um, equality for LBGTQIA folks. It includes, this, you know, there is a dispute within the federal government on this, but our position has been very clear. Um, that's covered, that kind of discrimination is against federal law, pregnancy, um, genetic information, disability, age, etc. And those values that, you know, what you sh are, your talent should determine your opportunity, not your racial background or some other um, irrelevant factor is a fundamental American value. So, yes, government has to look at, and our agency is charged with ensuring that value across industries. And so, tech is a growth industry. It's creating a large number of jobs. Obviously, we have to be there, too. We have to make sure that um, issues of harassment, issues of discrimination, barriers in hiring do not close the doors of opportunity. And that's not just good for you know, our basic values, but that's also good for the economy, right? Mm -hmm. You've got to field your best team and not leave talent on the table um, because of things that have nothing to do with the ability to do the job. I think, um, you know, government we, has a very odd and challenging uh, relationship with, uh, mm -hmm. with uh, tech. Um, you know, we, uh, we're trying to strike a balance between, you know, good regulation in the public interest so that we're protecting uh, people, which we, of course, have an obligation to do, while at the same time understanding that government doesn't have all the answers and we want to um, create, have space for, for innovation. Uh, and, you know, of course, we're seeing, you know, one of the big discussions happening now is just about, you know, social media and some of the real challenges there, the hate speech, the bullying, uh, the, you know, impact on our election last year. And what does, that, what does that mean? And what should government be doing so that we are uh, not allowing uh, social media to really subvert our democracy, uh, but while allowing social media to do all the incredibly positive and powerful things uh, that it does? Uh, and the same is true, for example, with um, when we talk about the future of work and employment. Uh, there are you know, companies that... Uh, you know, are moving in a different model where people are, 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 are contractors, uh, not uh, employees. And, and our whole, so much of our um, legal protections in this country and benefits, it's structured around employment, health care and retirement and uh, workers' compensation and so many legal protections. Uh, and, if, you know, with a continuing growth of um, people who are maybe, they look, sort of seem like they're employees, but they're not classified as employees, what does that mean? And that is a huge, major mega fight in the California legislature and elsewhere. And it's just like World War III because um, it impacts so many things. Mm -hmm. And so I think some of these um, uh, discussions and interactions are going to be ongoing. Um, Charlotte and Kelly, can you talk a little bit about um, this issue, the pipeline problem versus, versus actually looking at the retention problem and, and how your work um, is, uh, is a part of that pipeline and that um, we talked a little bit yesterday about the, re the revolving door um, for women in particular in tech, but for others in tech who are underrepresented. Um, how does your work affect that? 
Well, well, just from sort of a data perspective, I know a lot of you, you know, live, on, live and die by data. Um, you know, when you look at who's getting college degrees right now, women are the majority of those coming out of college. However, when you look at who's coming out with engineering and tech and other STEM degrees, it's one in five are women. And when you look at all those people who have STEM degrees, who's actually working in tech, men are like twice as likely to have a STEM career as the women who also have a, a STEM background. So right there, there's just a lot of you know, weeding of women out of, of some of these opportunities. So one of the things that we work on a lot is that pipeline issue, um, bringing role models for girls so that they can visualize someone who looks like them. And it's really important also to explore those issues of um, intersectionality of issues because women themselves are like the, one of the most diverse groups and they're, you know, 50% of the workforce. So we have to constantly be thinking about that. Um, in terms of retention, um, a big piece of it is just the hostile climate. You know, we, we had a forum, uh, you know, speaking of, of Senator Weiner's comment about the future of work, we had a future of work forum a couple years ago, and we had a group of women on our panel who talked about just how brutal the environment is, and um, it drives a lot of women out. Um, the other thing, and I know Senator Weiner also has, has worked on this when he was at the city council and now in the legislature, is just the need for paid leave to deal with the needs of families. That's really important. And it's not just important for women, because men need to be able to have time with their families as well. And if we don't provide that support for men, then again, it impacts women's career over the long haul because they have a, you know, a, a, a deeper burden that keeps them from thriving in the workplace. And I want to join, thank you for the paid leave efforts. That is excellent. Um, I wish more, you know, we could sort of spread that uh, eastward. Um, but, you know, on the pipeline question, I have to push back a little bit because, yes, there is, there are not enough people coming out of these sort of top computer programs who are women or underrepresent minorities, et cetera. But um, that does not account for the dearth of what you're seeing. And just to sort of piggyback on that, even if you assume that that was the, that was the issue, you would see much, much higher numbers for certainly for African Americans and Latinos for a lot others. So there's something else going on, and I think we have to be really fair and honest and not sugarcoat that. Mm -hmm. um, in particular, what the EEOC did was to take the time, and we have the benefit of uh, information that all employers with more than 100 employees are required to report every single year. They've been doing this since 1966. To take a deep dive into that um, information and look at the numbers by race and gender. There are problems with respect to disability and age as well, but we really had the data on race and gender and to look into that. And what you find is that the pipeline is not the problem. There's some other reason why people are not ending up in these positions. And for instance, with respect to underrepresented minorities, African Americans and Latinos, you have about 9% um, of folks coming out of the these top computer science programs. Um, that's what your graduate pool looks like of qualified people. Mm -hmm. um, so again, that's certainly not proportional representation to the population, and that's a problem. But you look around, and in terms of who gets hired, you're at about 5%. Right? So you're leaving a lot of talent on the table, and it's not because it's not there. And certainly, you know, and what we found is that Silicon Valley, I'm sorry to say it, is worse than in the nation writ large. And it's not only an issue in the tech jobs. It's at all levels that we looked at. So again, with the respect to the pipeline, you really have to ask yourself <laughs> why those results um, come out that way. And I think it's incumbent on us as an agency to use all the tools at our expense to have those conversations. And we've, I'm happy to say, and I applaud those companies that have been reaching out and really working on this, taking this seriously, trying to find ways to change it. Um, but we have a lot of tools at, at our um, disposal as well. And when we find things that um, you know, are troubling, then we do have the ability to bring a suit. Uh, so we look at all of this. We also, on the retention, one of the things that we are hearing so much about both at the agency and, of course, I think all of you 
read the news, um, is sexual harassment mm -hmm. with respect to retention of women. It is a huge issue. Um, it is an issue that has to do with culture and power, and it's not unique to the tech industry, but for various reasons, and we can, you know, I don't want to talk too long about this, but where you have, um, you know, extreme power differences sometimes between uh, certain individuals in the company and others, and sort of a decentralized culture and a culture of not reporting, that's where you see some of these problems. And again, that's not unique to tech, but it is certainly um, that qualifies uh, here, and we are, that's definitely something that we are taking very seriously. We have been um, spending a lot of time on harassment at the agency generally, but also trying to figure out those industries where there may be a problem that has to do with culture. Awesome. And, um, so we, we've been talking quite a bit about how um, policy affects the tech industry. Jennifer, yeah. on the flip side, the tech industry affects um, policy and government um, quite, a, quite substantially, and particularly with the U USDS, um, in terms of helping to really grow um, the capability, uh, the tech capabilities of, of government agencies. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, I remember in, in policy school, 100 years ago, there was uh, a, a great <laughs> saying, and it was something to the effect of um, people sort of, uh, I can't remember the saying, but basically that, that people will say, this thing is so, and the expectation is that it just is so. So when, a legisl when the legislature passes a law, this is so, the expectation is that all the folks that are working in the bureaucracies, that are working in the organizations that support uh, the government and our civil society are actually working to support that effectively. And it's just not the case that when someone states a policy or an organization states a policy that it's actually being implemented effectively, which is why groups like the EEOC are critical, which is why studies like the ones that Kelly's doing are, are critical. Um, but what's interesting to me uh, is how the United States Digital Service has been able to, within three years, we started in 2014, how many humans we've been able to support and affect very directly through saying, okay, um, I'll give an example by saying, okay, you know what? Uh, it seems like not a lot of veterans, uh, we've worked with the VA for, for all three years, not a lot of veterans seem to be signing up online. Mm. That's weird for healthcare, not health insurance, healthcare. That's really weird. Um, why don't we do some user research and literally go ask the users, uh, Hey, vets, why don't you try to sign up and let's see what's happening? This is not something that, happen that happens all the time. In many cases in government, people will say, why don't you act like you're the user mm -hmm. and then figure it out and see, let's see where the problems are. So, you know, our team went in, asked the users, uh, watched them actually try to sign up. It turns out it was literally impossible for about 90% <laughs> of vets who went on to the healthcare site to sign up because they had to have a very specific version of a very specific browser and they had to have a very specific version of a very specific form filler outer. <laughs> so, you know, it, it just, it was, it was not possible. And that wouldn't have been found out except for a team of user researchers and a team of engineers sitting down and talking to vets. Um, at the time that our team went in to take a look at this, uh, basically, you know, under 10% of folks, of veterans who went to the site had actually filled it out. Um, and now, as of, I think it was two weeks ago when I last checked, 259,000 veterans had signed up for their health care through this website. And what people had said before was, well, they, vets just don't like, they don't like to use the web. Mm. They prefer to go and sit down uh, in, in some building and talk to someone and see how that works. Turns out not true, <laughs> right? 259,000, definitely more at this point. And, and when I look at that, that is true direct impact. By the way, a lot of veterans are our most vulnerable populations, right? When I looked at that, when I look at things like that, I think, oh my gosh, we've actually helped lives. Now this was not by changing a law. This was not by changing, a, changing an overarching policy. This was by making it policy to have tech serve the people of this country, right? This was by saying, we're not just gonna say we wanna do it, but we're gonna utilize all available resources to do it and the people who understand it. 
Um, the same thing was true with healthcare.gov initially, right? So, you know, initially it, uh, you know, when, when it wasn't working, it was a web and a backend engineering issue, and it was a user design issue. So we, a bunch of people came in, worked on fixing it, and in, within four months we're able to fix it. We don't need to get into all the other stuff, but with regards to specifically <laughs> fixing that site, yeah. that is something where, for, where, you know, where people were helped. Um, and so there are multiple stories like that where it actually was totally legal, and the government had said, you should, you should do this. Everyone should get these services. But they weren't getting it because there wasn't the capacity. And the way we do it is actually by bringing in people for these tours of duty uh, from, from the tech sector. And I want to put out there, that's one way in which, uh, in which tech impacts government, uh, can impact government through these tour of duty models. There's also a colleagues at 18F that have people come in for one year, two years. But what I would also say is, one thing I was very proud of, and I stumbled into this, I didn't come into uh, building a team of, of uh, diverse humans that at one point was uh, majority women and almost, we didn't quite get there, 50% people of color, uh, <laughs> almost. Um, but, but we have a high bar at the, US, at the United States Digital Service, and that high bar is bringing in amazing, highly qualified people uh, and making sure that we have as diverse a team as possible because that is what is required to serve the people of our country. Uh, and also, we, we get better outcomes from it. Um, what I would say is, one of the things that we got excited about was that we could actually set an example for tech mm -hmm. because when we first started, folks were saying, oh, you can't, people can't come in and actually make a difference in government. You can't actually serve all these folks. You can't actually, it's not going to work. I won't say who said that, but it's not going to work. Um, it turns out that a diverse team of awesome people has come in and over the past three years made it work. And we're way more diverse in the tech sector, which is a low bar. Yeah. Right? So, I mean, I love, you know, love y'all. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, but, but, but that's, and that's something that we should all be striving for. Mm -hmm. And can I just add on yeah, to that is yes. one project that the Wims actually worked with your 18F sister yeah. agency is we had a grant program where we're helping states look to California's paid leave program and figure out how to model it and, you know, create it in their own states. But we've known from California's experience that the application process can be cumbersome and difficult. And we had 18F work with us to set up a template that states that are looking to expand paid leave can now use that yes. template and roll it out and have this wonderful implementation system so that people mm -hmm. can apply for their benefits and receive their benefits very, very simply. And so, you know, that's another way where we've sort of embraced technology and tried to figure out how can we use it to make it work for, for people. High five. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I think government has a really difficult uh, relationship with technology on a few different levels. Uh, first of all, uh, when I when the healthcare.gov meltdown happened, uh, even though I was politically like horrified because I, I could see that this was going to do political, long-lasting political damage to our effort to have universal health care, um, but I wasn't surprised. Unfortunately, um, my first uh, government uh, job was in 2002. I uh, uh, joined the San Francisco City Attorney's Office as a deputy city attorney. I had been in the private sector, came into the city attorney's office, uh, and they gave me my computer, and they logged me into my email account. Uh, and this is 2002, and my email account was, if you remember this, um, for those maybe who aren't so young, uh, it was <laughs> CC Mail. Does anyone remember CC Mail? Yeah. It was like the most primitive kind of email in existence. You would have had, you know, gotten... And then six months later, we quote unquote upgraded to Lotus Notes, uh, and, <laughs> and uh, it, it, it was just like this extraordinary. And then uh, when I was on the board of supervisors, because the city calendaring system was so terrible, uh, at supervisors' offices we all just set up um, uh, Gmail or Google calendars because it was just much more functional, uh, and you know it made it harder when public records requests came in. It was a little more cumbersome to like to extract you know, the data it should have been in a much more you know, global, comprehensive way, but it's just the city calendar wasn't that usable. The, uh, so there's a lot of, lot of challenges there around just simply how government uses technology. But then there's also the issue when we talk about government regulating technology. 
uh, you know, policymakers often just don't really necessarily fully understand technology. It's not a criticism. You're not, you know, we all come from different backgrounds and different forms of expertise. Uh, but we've had some bills in the legislature. There, you know, this issue of the Internet of Things and regulating it. You know, and there was a, you know, that what was a Cal of the doll, that mm -hmm. horrible situation where the doll was like, you know, asking the kids to provide information and, you know, and some some ex excesses that happen. There's immediately a bill to, to like globally regulate the Internet of Things, and you know, some of us really push back against that, saying yeah, you identified a real problem that needs a solution, but let's not jump the gun here and like stifle amazing in innovation that's going to help a lot of people. So it's a very difficult relationship. Yeah. Um, we, we, had a, we had a panel, uh, the closing panel last night really addressed um, the tech industry in San Francisco and how it's affecting the demographics of the city and, 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 and the, the types of things that, um, particularly at the, um, when we to talk about this pipeline a, a, a little bit too, is in how tech companies can really engage with San Francisco um, kids and youth and, and really to help uh, grow our, our diverse pipeline here at home. Um, Senator, you've done a lot of, uh, thank you for the, what you've done around LGBT rights and uh, LGBTQ rights and, um, and uh, the Family Leave Act and, and, and several other things. Um, how would you say that the tech industry is affecting our California economy, our local economy, and, and how, um, how can the tech industry better engage with uh, opportunities to create change in the industry? So, uh, and this is, you know, I, I came in the office, I was elected in November 2010 to the Board of Supervisors, took office January 2011, when we were still coming out of the recession, we had, we had like, I think, 9% unemployment. Mm -hmm. um, it was, uh, I mean, housing is always expensive in San Francisco, but, it, you know, things were at least somewhat stable. And, and, it, and I remember my first year in office, it was all about, it was all about jobs. You know, we, we mm. created the, the, ta the mid-market tax zone mm. to try to help mid-market, but also we wanted, we, you know, we, San Francisco had hemorrhaged headquarter companies for so long. We wanted, you know, not just Twitter, but other companies to, to be here. That was so important. Uh, fast forward a few years uh, with, with these just absolute explosion of housing costs uh, and everything flipped. And all of a sudden it was, you know, tech is ruining the city. Te it's tech cause the housing to become more expensive. It's tech's responsibility. You know, just get Google and Facebook, get them all to just pay a bunch of money to, for more affordable housing. Uh, and my response has always been, listen, of course tech has a role to play, as does every industry, um, but let's be really clear. We have to look in the mirror as a community about why we're having these problems. Uh, tech did not cause our housing problems. Our housing problems have been brewing for 50 years because we made it almost impossible to build housing, whether it's for low-income people or for market rate or anything else. We've made it, you know, it shouldn't take five years to get a, a development approved that's 100% uh, within zoning. We've done that. And yes, we hit a tipping point. At some point, you know, job growth is such in, a, in the most amazing city in the world, in my view, uh, that you're gonna, you know, you're, you're, things are, you're gonna pour lighter fluid over the housing situation. Uh, but the reality is that we as a community made choices in California and in San Francisco for years that we devalued housing. We have what I call a housing last policy. Every, pol every other priority is more important than housing, and that's how we got here. And so when we have you know, one housing unit being created in the Bay Area uh, over the last seven years for every eight jobs being created, it's not a surprise that we had a job increase in the Bay Area and we didn't prepare for it. Uh, the same is true with our education system. Uh, you know, we've, uh, um, I've worked with, for example, an uh, organization called Mission Bit, and there are others like it that, you know, who really go into our schools and make sure that our own kids are getting interested in and engaged in STEM education because we're creating all these wonderful jobs. We want our own kids to be able to access those jobs. Uh, but Devon was on a panel last night. Yeah, talking about and so it. on yeah. is fantastic. Yeah. Uh, but the reality is California only requires two years of math education. You know, Arkansas and other states require more. We're at this low end of the math education we require, uh, and why aren't we increasing that? Why aren't we allowing maybe computer science 
uh, to count as one of those years? Why aren't we doing things to really encourage kids in our own school system uh, to, to pursue um, a career, or at least consider uh, a career uh, in, in tech? And so, uh, and, and the tech sector absolutely has a role to play. I think supporting these organizations that are going into our schools and trying to mentor kids uh, and trying to really broaden out um, who is getting interested in STEM education is so, so important. Supporting our public schools in general. You know, I wanna, you know, uh, when, when Salesforce gets involved and with our middle school program, middle, our middle schools have been so challenged and they're starting to turn around. Um, other companies that are getting involved to support our schools, it matters a lot. Uh, and then the tech sector, I think, uh, need, and I think it's happening, and it needs to happen more, needs to support good housing policy uh, and, and work in a broad coalition to turn things around. We passed a major housing package in the legislature uh, this year, uh, and uh, that's just the beginning. We have a lot more work to do. Uh, but when these fights happen around housing, uh, the tech sector needs to be a very vocal voice in favor of housing. Agreed, agreed. I want to open it up to a couple of questions from the audience. Um, there was one over here. Thanks. Hi, everybody. My name is Cynthia. I'm with American Institutes for Research. Uh, my question is actually for Charlotte. The diversity in high tech uh, report, so important. Um, I hope everybody's had a chance to read it or will be able to read it. Was really curious about utilization with the report in terms of how it's been received, how it's been used, and I'm also curious about uh, future plans for, for more research and what you see the research needs is, uh, in this area. Okay, great. Well, I'm glad that um, it is getting attention. We have, um, so this report was issued in 2016. At the time, we had a public uh, hearing and brought in uh, testimony from a wide host of experts to also inform what the numbers were telling us. And so we had, we actually brought in people from venture capital, employment experts, um, employers, civil rights advocates to sort of talk about, okay, what are we actually seeing? And um, so we were happy to have both that and the numbers that sort of gave a very stark picture um, to put together and have had some uh, interesting conversations with the Hill. I know that the um, uh, Congressman Scott, Bobby Scott from Virginia is, has been a big advocate on this. Um, some of you may have seen that the um, Congressional Black Caucus and the Congressional Hispanic Caucus have both begun to really focus and drill down on this issue as well um, because it is such a big uh, a sector. So. I anticipate we'll continue to follow up. One of the things that we are doing, so that's sort of focus on the pipeline piece. One of the things that we're doing is really trying to also get our arms around the retention piece and mm -hmm. some of the harassment issues that we've seen. And obviously the sexual harassment has gotten a lot of attention, but racial um, issues and other kinds of hostilities. There's also a real age discrimination issue there appears mm -hmm. to be. We don't have the, the numbers in the same way but um, you know the average age, I think, in a lot of the tech companies is in the, the late 20s, like 28, 29. And most workers, just to be clear, the average American worker is 42. Right? That's the average age. So we are continuing to look at all of these things, and um, I appreciate your uh, your raising that. So you know, we also are rolling out some anti-harassment treatment. We actually took about a year and a half, if you can believe it, and brought together. And this is, you know tribute to uh, two colleagues of mine on the commission, Commissioner uh, Feldblum, who's a Democrat, and then the acting chair, Victor, uh, Victoria Lipnick, who is a Republican, came together, brought employers, employees from all across different um, parts of different work, kinds of workplaces, academics, different expertise to sort of study why do we have so much harassment. We've got so much harassment in the U.S. that our agency could only do those cases. We could just stop doing everything else and it would be full employment for all of our employees if we only did the harassment stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's that bad. And unlike other things, that's something you know in like kindergarten you're not supposed to be doing, right? Mm -hmm. You, you kind of like get that that whole, and yet it still keeps happening. So we really took about a year and a half to study that. And um, the two of them came out with this a report that sort of encapsulates that's unlike a lot of the stuff, because we do a lot of wonky, kind of boring government stuff. This one's really accessible. 
And one of the things that I love about it is it's got some warning signs. So it doesn't mean if you have, there's like seven things that if you've got this going on, you might have a harassment problem. And one of it is, one of them is extreme power differentials. And particularly in, you know, I'm not gonna pick on tech, I'm an attorney. It's true in law. It's true in a lot of industries. It's probably, you know, it seems to be a, an issue in Hollywood where you've got a <laughs> sort of rainmaker type who is bringing in a lot of money. Um, that can really lead to, uh, you know, people not, even if they see warning signs, they kind of like let that go longer or they pay somebody off or don't deal with it in the way that, you, you know, you really need to if you don't want it to become a, a huge issue. So I'll stop there. But. Awesome, awesome. Um, we are running out of time. Uh, so, uh, and I think we could go on forever. For a long time, not forever. <laughs> um, so in, uh, I'm sure there are other questions. I know there were other questions in the audience. How can, just really quickly, how can people get a hold of you or your departments? Uh, DOL.gov slash Women's Bureau. Say it one more time. Actually, DOL.gov slash WB. Okay, cool. Great. Uh, there are USDS people standing in the audience. Can you just stand up right now and wave your hands around? We're here. There's one, there's Julie. Got to stand up tall, people. Okay. Come on, hurry, hurry. <laughs> and Julie's talking later today, too. Um, and so talk to them. Stand up higher so people can see you. <laughs> um, <laughs> great, thank you. Um, and, uh, and Julie's awesome, even though she's not standing up. Um, and then also usds.gov. Uh, also, I want to say I'm really excited to be slightly above average in terms of 42. Uh, and want to say that USDS, um, while we, we had done, we were working towards doing really well, we are always uh, needing to improve uh, our, our, not just our numbers, but our ability to have a diverse organization. And I want to let you know, if you ever are thinking about the ability, like, about whether or not you can make a difference um, for your fellow humans, um, one key way is if you're an engineer, a product manager, a designer, whatever, um, please talk to these folks because you can make a difference in many, many people's lives. Terrific. Um... So we are at www.eeoc.gov. Um, the the uh, tech, diversity in tech report is there. Information about our anti-harassment training, which is sort of a new training that just looks at how to do things without this whole um, just talking about the law, but like how do you have respectful workplaces? Um, and obviously, and Sorry to do this, guys, but I'm going to call out our fantastic, <laughs> fantastic San Francisco district office folks. We've got the inimitable uh, Linda Lee and Bill Tamayo, who heads up the office, and Roberta Steele, who is our um, regional attorney. And uh, yes, we've got, it's, it's uh, so fun, we've got this tech inclusion desk, what is it, the fortune teller? So you can... <laughs> Can people hear that? <laughs> it's a low-tech game. I love yeah. So you, you got all the Cliff Notes version of the report right there awesome. on the, the cootie catcher. All right. Um, so uh, uh, the easiest way to get a hold of me is you can just message me through uh, any social media, through my Facebook page, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, I check that myself. Um, and so feel free to uh, message me if you, wanna, if you need to get in touch with my office. I just Google my name and you'll see our uh, Senate website and all the contact information uh, for our capital staff and for uh, district staff. Uh, and we, you know, we love, I love feedback and also uh, when people have ideas for bills. Um, so uh, feel free to be in touch. Awesome. Thank you all. Thank you. Oh, Melinda, can I just say, as I look out in this audience, I would love to see more diversity like this in tech and I hope next year that we have like, you know, everyone brings a friend or something yeah. and we can see more of this conversation in tech. So thank you. Bring a friend. Thank you. Yes. Thank you.